Thank you for finding the NSE podcast on YouTube. To find links for our online hospitality security training, check out the video description below. Enjoy the Nightlife Security Podcast. This week's show is brought to you by Studio 47, San Diego's premier recording and production studio. Visit www.globalbpm.com. Welcome to the Nightclub Security Podcast, a professional resource for the nightclub security industry. Whether you're a nightclub bouncer, guard, owner, or operator, this is the podcast for you. We're here to inform, educate, and entertain. Let's get started. Welcome, everybody, to Nightclub Security Podcast. My name is Manny Marquez. I'm here with nightclub security industry expert Robert C. Smith. We're coming to you from Studio 47 in sunny San Diego. This is our third episode. Robert, how are you doing this morning? Doing great, man. I love that intro music. You like it? Yep. Got a good beat, right? Love the beat. Uh, So we're getting back in the studio. We took the week off of July 4th. Our studio professional, Antonio Aguilera, took the week off on vacation. So we're getting back in the studio for our third show. This is actually going to be the second part of a show we started last week on civil liability. So this is part two of that show. But before we get started, I wanted to talk a little bit about this podcast. And you know, we've been putting this out into the uh, the internet and the web. And it's been interesting to see where we're getting downloads from because you can kind of see uh, what countries, what areas of the United States. And, and we have listeners all the way in the the UK. We have listeners in Australia. Uh, we've seen some listeners in, in Alaska. And so it's it's really cool to see that even though we're just getting started, that we're reaching people, you know, halfway around the world. I love that. I love to know that, that this information is not just being listened by you and I and Antonio and maybe our friends, but people we've never heard of. It's great. Yeah. And it's, it's, I, I sit there and I think when I see those, those stats come up, uh, I try to imagine the guy sitting in Australia, what sort of things he's searching for on the internet or how he found us. And, and, uh, We'd actually like to hear about that. If you're out there and you're you're in a foreign country, or you know, how'd you hear about us? How'd you find us? Uh, that'd be an interesting story Manny, to tell the listeners. Remember, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Spain, most main countries, large countries, involved countries within the hospitality industry that that take the hospitality industry as part of their their income, they've got mandates regarding bouncer or in-house guard licensing. Australia is one of them. So here's a guard, possibly, who has a, a federal license listening to our podcast about the information we put out about the United States. I, I find it interesting that, how did he find us? You know, where, where, where did he come from? How did, it's, really, it's really cool to see, and I think that's one of the, be one of the nice things or the, the neat things about this podcast is, is watching this thing grow. And even though this is only our third show, we're just getting started. You know, we have a lot to learn, obviously, but I, I'm excited to see what comes of this. On that note, you know, this is going to be a process creating this pro, uh, this podcast where we're going to need feedback from our listeners. And, you know, we want this to be a two-way street. Uh, we want to hear from you. We want to get questions, comments, feedback. What do you think we could do better? What would you like to hear about? And we invite you to, to give us that sort of feedback. You can reach us at questions at nightclubsecurity.com. But we'll announce that again at the end of the show. Let's see here, Robert, before we get going, I just wanted to talk about last week's show or our previous show because we were off last week. And basically what we started with was a topic on civil liability. We were trying to wrap this show up uh, or actually this topic up in one show, but we landed up going long. And so we, we had to break it up into two shows. In that last show, you can go back and listen to it. In fact, I encourage you to. Uh, but we talked about liability. And, and the first thing we touched on and what is it and how can it affect you? And just some of the talking points that we, we covered was what was the different types of liabilities? What do you do uh, or when do you become liable? What is the spectrum of liability? And what are some examples of lawsuits with dollar amounts and judgments around liability? Second part that we went into is how exposed are you? And we always talk about the window of liability and how open or how shut is that window. And can you ever close that window completely? That window's never closed. Just, I wanted to say that again. We said it last or two weeks ago, but everyone listening, I don't care if you're a litigator and you don't agree with our point of view. And again, the disclaimer that we have to put out is we're not attorneys. 
this is a general knowledge based type of podcast information session but that window of liability that you mentioned it has got to be remembered. It should be a staple for every guard, manager, and owner to understand what that means. And you're always liable. That window is always open. You can only hope to close it a little bit. The next topic that we covered was what is the concept of reasonable care? We talked about the national industry standard and how courts view that. Went into the idea of shocking the conscience of the court, your actions. We went into what is a life cycle of a typical lawsuit, and I think an interesting point on that is is, is normally these la- these lawsuits uh, will go right into uh, the very end of the statute of limitations. I got a call, Manny, from an from an owner, and it was kind of timely. He was really pissed off when he started the call, so I let him vent. He's talking to me, telling me about this lawsuit that they did nothing wrong, and it was nearly three years ago. Now he's in a state where the statute of limitations is three years, and he was so pissed off venting to me because he had no one else to vent to other than maybe his attorney, his insurance agent, that he couldn't believe that this asshole guest, his words, was suing and they waited for three years to file that. But they do that on purpose. Absolutely on purpose. And I asked him, do you remember every detail of that lawsuit? Do you think your employees, do you still have them? Did you write anything? Did you save your video? At the end of the conversation, he got it. But what if he had listened to this podcast four years ago? And he saved everything he had. Oh, he, would, he would have been better armed to, uh, to fight this. He wouldn't be calling me and being angry about it. Well, he, he might call you, but... <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, so we talked about shocking the conscience of the court, uh, the life cycle. And then we talked a little bit about the spectrum of operators from the very you know, well-managed, the progressive forward-thinking operator you know, all the way down to the guy who has no idea concept of, of what liability is. And then we talked about who's responsible for managing this risk. And, and one of the main points on that area was is it, it's basically a, a top-down. Everybody's got to buy in, but it comes from the ownership all the way down uh, to the security guard and the employees. So today, that leads us to today's topic. And basically, uh, the third part of this topic around civil liability is... What can I start doing today to limit my, my liability? And we have a, a pretty good discussion. I think we're going to try to make these shows about an hour. So we have some room to talk about this area. Um, but before we actually jump right into the meat of the show, I wanted to uh, just throw a mention out on our podcast page uh, at the bottom of the, the podcast and the show notes. Uh, we have an area for comment and we got a, a really glowing comment and feedback about our or actually our second podcast from an Anthony Kraut. And it sounds like he may have been uh, one of your students or... In, in Ventura, probably last year, the county of Ventura came up with some grant funding and paid for over 200 of the guards, bouncers, in-house guards to go through the state licensing program within California. And uh, he was one of the attendees. Okay, so somehow he, he, he got a hold of our podcast, listened to it, and it basically reminded him of the ideas... And the topics that were talked about, trained on at that tra- at that session, and uh, I just want to read part of his comment here. It says, "For anyone who reads this, go to the training. It's awesome. The training will make you think a little different about going anywhere in public. It will open your eyes to a lot of things you never thought of before." And that's that's you know I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of the uh, students come out of these training courses that we put on and. It's always amazing because there's always topics and ideas that we talk about that people, I think they know it, but it's never been said. And, and Anthony's just one. Thanks, Anthony, by the way, for that. And, and please, anyone else listening, send those comments, concerns, or questions in. But Anthony is just one of a, a thousand people. And it used to amaze me like it did you that when they hear this stuff, it, it shocks them and it, it jogs their memory of good and bad and what they do. But now, to me, I expect to hear that from operators or workers. I just expect it. I'll get a group of people that the first five minutes in a training session, their arms are crossed, the body language language is saying, I don't want to be here. And within 30 minutes, they're engaged. And at the end of that session, after whether it's a a national host platinum session or it's California with their licensing program, they're coming up at a break, especially at the end of the session, shaking my hand and saying, holy, wow, man, I I had no idea this was going to be this good and, and 
really make me feel good about what I'm doing. And that's the idea. Yeah. And I think going back 12 years ago when we first met, I mean, that was my reaction to the program. And I can say from that point on as an operator, as a manager, it really changed my perspective on how we do things. And it, it went beyond just the security aspect. It, it went, uh, you know, it kind of crossed over into all aspects of the management. So Anthony, what was the name? Anthony Kraut, we thank you for your comment. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, make sure you're passing us along to your colleagues and uh, turning them on to the podcast. So Robert, one of the things that we wanted to make a regular part of our show is, is doing a news piece and finding something that's timely and in the news and have a short discussion about it and kind of relate it to our various topics that we'll be talking about. And so you came across a, a very interesting article. I believe it was out of uh, the Daily Herald. Illinois. Okay. What was that story about? It, it's a real typical story. And, and one of the reasons I think we both like this idea of news, this is not something I've created. It's not something you've created. It's not a textbook theory. This is real life. So in this case, it's very typical. And this could be, don't think about Illinois. Think about your yard, your backyard, your, your bar, two guys in a bar. One's a little bit too intoxicated. Have you seen that before? In this case, these two guys in this bar, one a little too intoxicated. The guard moves in to tell the drunk, you got to leave. While he's getting them out, they turn on him and he's assaulted. Throw him down, kick him, beat him, hit his head, kick him. They hurt him pretty good. The police come. These guys are charged with six or seven different assault counts. They eventually plead guilty to one minor count, get some probation, some alcohol uh, intervention stuff. Well, what's important in this case is the bouncer felt empowered. Whether he was told to do it, whether he was taught, who knows, but he is now suing those two patrons. I think that's that's great. I think that's And this this is something that's very unusual for the industry cuz Normally what happens, it's the guest that sues the establishment or the bouncer. Here, the tables are turned, and now the bouncer is suing the guest. And that's crazy. I mean, for the listeners, think about the last time you heard of one of your employees who was hurt by a guest, and they took it past anything else. Usually, you get them out the door. Maybe you'll detain them for the police. Maybe you'll have them arrested then maybe you'll press charges. And if you're, if you're not doing any of that, you're certainly not going to go sue them. This, this establishment went all the way, and something I've been teaching for 14 years. Well, we're not sure if it's the establishment. It could just be the bouncer acting on his own. Absolutely. But whether it's the establishment or the guard, I've been teaching for 14 years, and it's rare, and I applaud this guy for taking that next step. He was, he was hurt. And I, I, I know that, you like this course of action. And I think what, in reality, what happens in, in my experience is you have something like this happen. The bouncer takes it on the chin. He chalks it up as, well, this is part of my job and this is what I signed up for. And it's basically, I guess, considered the hazard of the job. But here's an individual um, that took it a step further and actually filed a civil lawsuit against the two customers. And just for the listeners, I'll just mention that after every one of our shows on our podcast page off, off our website, uh, we do do show notes. So I'm going to put the link to this article uh, if you want to check it out yourself. It'll be interesting to see what happens with this case. Well, and, and most of them, it'll, it'll end up settling out. I'm sure these two guests, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm sure they're not millionaires. And I'm sure the guard has some medical expenses, some other things that he just can't pay for. And he can legally do this. I think, I think the guest window of liability is wide open for what they did. And I think the amount of the civil lawsuit is, uh, it's not a big amount. I mean, it's, it's substantial. It's $50,000 in damages that he's seeking. So it's not like a multi-million dollar suit. And I'm sure these two patrons that he's suing are probably not uh, well off. And that's not the main motivation. But you know, I can only imagine this guy had some so like you said, medical bills, pain and suffering. And well, he's just, and he's just looking for a little restitution. And, and remember, he, even if he gets a monthly payment through county social services where these guys pay from their job 50 bucks a month or 50 bucks a week, it's a win. The guards are held accountable and held to a higher standard. Your guests should be held 
to a higher standard, especially if they get violent. Well, let's talk about the bigger picture here, because since this is so unusual that something like this happens, what if more guards did this? What if, you know, what if, what if that was the norm? I, I would love it. I, I, I really think that we're going we're gonna to make that happen. I think we're going to educate enough people, and when you're educated, you're, you're a better employee. And if you're a better employee, not only will you not have the same violence, the same trouble, the same problems, but you'll be able to seek the answer to whatever the issue was in a different way. And certainly, if you're assaulted in the course of your job, and you did it right, you did your job correctly, you should seek some sort of damage, especially from guests that think they're entitled or they're just allowed because they may be at some level intoxicated. That's not right. I, I think we can make a make a substantial change in our industry where there's a there's a consequence. And if the police charge a simple misdemeanor, maybe this is a monetary consequence of twenty five grand apiece, should this be the way it comes out, that these guys decide I better think twice. Well let's go beyond that because let's imagine that this was the norm. That businesses, employees empowered themselves to take action against, you know, their, 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 the civilian or the customer that acts out. And if this was the norm, wouldn't it seem to make sense that people would change their behavior? That, that's just a natural byproduct. That would be a natural change. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's one of those things that it's, you know, I've, uh, from my experience of being in operations, it's, you know, you've already had a that experience, that incident, that seems to be enough. I just want to get past it and move on. But also for owners and, and operators and you know the, the workers, the, the security guards, to think, well, maybe there's something here and, and I should look into this. One, one thing, we'll close this out on this news topic. I don't want people to think we want you to just sue frivolously. Look, guards, you know your job. And while you're asking someone to leave, if they turn and push you and they run out the door, oops, oh, well, let them run. Yes, you were assaulted in every state in our country. You were assaulted. You were pushed by that guy. It doesn't give you the right to run after him, tackle him, beat him down because you were assaulted. Bull, leave it, drop it. Let him go. That's your mistake. Let your friends make fun of you for that guy pushing you. Drop it. However, if you're beat down by two guests, they kick you and hit you and cause major injury, you need to consider going after them to help supplement your income. Whether you get workman's comp, whether you seek damages, you need to at least consider it. Um, and if you have questions about this, please, as Manny mentioned earlier, go to questions at nightclubsecurity.com and send them to us, and we'll point you in the right direction. Yeah, and again, we're going to put this article uh, with the show notes, so if you want to take a read, uh, please do. Robert, I think this is probably a good point. We take a break. When we come back, we'll jump into the main topic. What can I start doing a day to limit my liability? If you like our show, visit nightclubsecurity.com for more information and access to free resources. Remember, that's www.nightclubsecurity.com. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, Robert, before we jump into the main topic of today's show, I just want to remind everybody that uh, you and I, were, we're not lawyers. Uh, we're speaking in general terms uh, and discussion points uh, to give the listeners a better perspective. So if you do have uh, questions, legal questions, please consult um, an attorney. And with that being said, let's go ahead and, and dive in. Uh, so the main part of today's discussion is, what can I start to do today to limit my liability? And I, I think a good way to set this up, Robert, for the listener is, if you just purchase the bar, so you're a brand new owner of a bar, how would you approach it? What would be the very first thing that you would do as, as a new club owner? Well, I, I think you're you're very familiar with this. You've You've been in many operations, and that first... If you jump in to make changes immediately, the changes just won't take place, I don't think. So give it a little time. Take a couple of weeks, maybe a month. Do your self-assessment of the bar. What do you see there? Yes, you're going to look at the menu. You're going to look at the music. You're going to look at the lighting. But what I want you to look at is what are we doing proactively? What are we not doing? What is happening regarding liability and safety in my venue under my roof? From lighting to lines, parking lot to back of the house, policies, escorting someone out, checking IDs, all the stuff that are too often overlooked. Make a conscious effort, whether you're coming into the operation new, and if you're listening to this and already an operator, go in and start tonight. 
go in and do like if you were a new owner and take a look at all these things. That's the that to me that's the very first thing I would do because you have to identify areas where you lack or you're underachieving to make yourself better. And I think uh you know the way that I would approach it would be is uh to kind of take a step back. I mean sometimes really being able to observe you, you almost have to pull yourself back a little bit. If you get too involved in the actual operations and you're too busy bussing tables or pouring drinks or getting ice. You're not giving yourself the time to properly observe. And I would say walk around with a notepad, you know, put a notepad in your back pocket and and look at things and and look at them from a, a customer perspective. And, you know, with the idea of liability, keep that in mind as well. And just, just changing your perspective. The, the kind of the next on my list would be after I have that couple of weeks go by and I look at the operation and I see what I'm going to do is, is then I'd line up all my staff. I'd have a group meeting. I'd have a large meeting. I would, I would mandate that if you're not there, you're fired. This is something that is going to change the mindset of this, this group, this, this team that, that I want to form. And again, don't just think that we're talking about a new owner. If you're a current owner, you could do this within a week or two and say, okay, I'm going to change what I do. We're going to have an all employee meeting and I'm going to lay out what my design is, what my plan is to change the way we do things. The, the meeting is critical, not just to put the employees on notice, this is what you want. Underlying, you're also letting them know that you want them to change, that the mindset of the operation is going to go in a different direction or a slightly different direction of what it has been. We're going to look at things we haven't looked at before. At that meeting, in Involve your employees. Ask the six-month door guard, what do you think we could do to be a safer venue? Ask a bartender, a 20-year bartender, what do you think we could do to be safer? And I I, I think another part of that meeting, and basically the, the, the main objective of that meeting should be raising the awareness because as you and I both know, you know, if you're not aware of something, how do you know what's going on? Well, you can see things through one set of glasses. Your employees, depending on their life experience and experience in the industry, will see them through another set of glasses. And getting the team together, and once they know that you're serious, once they know there's a real change, they'll start to see things through the same set of glasses that everyone's looking at, and that's valuable. When you get their input, take it, be, 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 be respectful with it, use it or don't use it, but at least you're asking them to get them involved on what is wrong or what could be better or what needs to be changed at, at our venue. I say our venue, not my venue. And I think the idea of involving your staff is very important because any good manager knows that you, you have to have that buy-in and support. And I think that if people feel as if something's being shoved down their throat, they're a little bit more resistant into making the change. So getting that feedback from your employees is an important part of the buy-in. And remember, and I'm sure you've had employees that would just sit there like a bump on a log when you ask for input, nothing's happened, nothing's said. So then if that happens and you're, if, you, if you have an operation like that where you don't get the feedback you think you can, have some private meetings. Ask John, ask Sandra, hey, we need to talk two minutes each Yeah. So, and ask them alone. Yeah, so uh, uh, that's, a, that's a good point. You know, the, the one-on-ones is, is an important part of the process whenever you want change to happen because it... It gives the employees an opportunity to voice to voice their opinions and thoughts. So, we got the assessment. We've sat down. We've talked to the staff. Uh, we'll raised the awareness. Put them on notice. We, we've had them buy in. What's next? Change your hiring practice. Too too way too often nationally, bars and clubs they do it on the fly. I, I know you have done it. I haven't asked you this before, but I know you've done it where. It's Thursday, you know you got an event tomorrow, even no event, but you need a guard and you hire the first guy that walks in. <laughs> you just can't do that. Plan your hiring processes out. Have an interview phase, have an application phase. Don't just hire when you need. Have people waiting in the wings to come on. Board. And that process it definitely takes some planning because you almost have to have you know, two on your pocket uh, so you can pull someone out of your hat when you need to. And it's, it's, it's really difficult to hire quality people if you're doing it in a rushed manner. Well, let's just, let's just assume that our operator is going to do it the way we're suggesting, or at least try it. So 
have an application process where they come in to fill out their application, that's your first chance to see that employee. If they come in and flip flops and a pair of shorts to your business to collect an application and fill it out, maybe you don't want to hire that guy. Send the message that you want them to look like they're ready to be hired. What if you happen to hold the interview right then? That's how they showed up. After their application is done, maybe the day later, you're going to do interviews. Can I, uh, <laughs> you saying that reminds me of the guy who fills out his application and then orders a drink at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, you're hired. He's, he's ready to go to work. Yeah, I got, I'll have a, a shot and a beer while I fill this application out. So changing the hiring practice is kind of, again, going back to that self-assessment, operators, managers really look at how you hire and what you do with the information. Are you doing background checks? If you're in a state like California where hiring a bouncer is no longer just hiring a guy or a girl, you've got to get them licensed. If you're not in a state that requires background checks, why not do it anyway? Why not find the best possible applicant? They're out there. Do you really want the convicted felon who's on probation for beating up his neighbor, uh, beating up his wife? Look, people have problems in life, and that's okay, great. But is this the person you want at your door or dealing with intoxicated college kids on a Friday night? I don't think so. And that opens you up to more liability. Because you're putting that individual, they're being responsible for a very potentially costly aspect of your business in terms of a civil li lawsuit. So it it almost behooves you to, to take your time and, and vet this person properly. It absolutely, and not just behooves you, but this area right here I have seen come back to hurt several operators when they're asked. So you hired my, you hired this person. Did you make any calls to check their references? Well, no. Did you do a background check on them to see if they were maybe on parole, probation? Well, no. Did you call any of their references that they listed? Well, no. Oh, actually, on their application, they didn't list any references, did they? No. You did nothing. And and if that individual was involved in a a lawsuit that employee a good lawyer is going to peel back that those layers of the onion and, and find that out <laughs> manny uh, the, you've thrown out a softball a bad attorney will find those those are simple ones all right so the hiring practice spending a little bit more time vetting your employees getting the right people to work for you what do we do next continue to work from your first meeting you had now it's a week a month two months gone by continue to change that culture instill different habits. The culture of your venue is driven by whoever the operator is. If the owner comes in and gets high and drunk at the bar, the workers are going to see that's okay. Change that culture. Do things that you told them you want done and habits will change within the bar. One of those things is living by your policy manuals. If you don't have a policy manual, you need to implement one. Policies, procedures, get it out there tell the employees what you want, and now you're going to change that culture and get them in the habit of doing things. For example, one of the policies that, that a lot of my clients have is they confiscate bad or fake IDs. It's written in their policy manual. Now, that may seem like just a small thing. If one Friday night a 20-year-old guest pleads and begs to get her ID back, the 22-year-old friend comes up and says, I really need that. I, I'm sorry. I won't let it happen again. And the guard or the manager decides instead of arguing or instead of saying no, they give it back and they let them walk away. So part of that culture is, is changing the policies and procedures. That policy is written. The ones for, that need to be changed. It's written for a reason. You do it for a reason. You're taking IDs, you're confiscating them, or you're turning them over to law enforcement for a reason. But now you've given it back to the person. You just violated your policy. And in court, once again, that smart and even that dumb attorney will pull that one negative part of what you do. Well, you violated that policy, didn't you, Manny? If you violated that policy, what, else what, are other, you, yeah. what other policies are you violating? So changing the culture, and being proactive about changing the habits, and doing the job. If you have a policy manual, follow it. I, I like to, when you say the word habits, I like to think of it in terms of a sports team. And, you know, the good sports teams have repetitions. And when you go into practice, you have the fundamental things that, that you work on. And uh, a sports team that has good fundamentals uh, is normally the team that's going to be able to be more successful. So in terms of habits, you think about 
the way you treat each shift, do you have a routine of uh, coming in, doing a walkthrough, checking in with all your employees, uh, making sure that everyone who needs to be clocked on is clocked on, doing a line check in the kitchen, you know, those sorts of things that are habitually done every day set you up for success. And, and that sort of behavior needs to be transferred to every employee. One of the things that I did as a manager was when you came to work, you come in and you check in with the manager on duty. Hi, how you doing? Anything today that I need to know about? An exchange of information would usually take place. And then you let the staff go about their job. In addition to that, when they leave, another thing I would like to do is 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 have them come check out with me. Uh, hey, Manny, that's that's all for me today. And again, this is another opportunity for exchange of information. And this is a very proactive approach of management because these two points of contact of beginning and the end of the shift allow you to find out things that are happening in your restaurant or in your, your club or, or in your, your bar. So those sorts of, of habits are good to get into and, and, and find yourself a routine. And I think the managers and the staff that find themselves in routines are able to do their job a lot better and be more successful. Well, and remember what this, this podcast and this topic is about. Finding ways to limit your liability. And, and don't get wrapped up, listeners, in one piece of information that's put out regarding one of these possible changes you can make. I mean, we discussed coming in, hiring, changing hiring practices, changing culture, uh, changing habits, policy manuals, asking employees their thoughts. We talked about that. And all these things together can really make your employees a better person to limit and lower your liability. One point within the culture habit part of this is being proactive with things. If you teach your employees to be proactive during this cultural change and habit change, they're going to do things before problems happen. Here's a very simple example. I would bet every one of the listeners in their bar or club, you have regulars. The regular customer that comes in with his uncle, he comes in alone, he comes in with his buddy, and on a Friday night or a Tuesday afternoon, they drink to excess, you always have to ask them to leave. You'll see them walking in the door and you look at your partner and go, holy crap, and then when he walks up, you say, hey, Johnny, good to see you. And in the back of your mind, you're thinking, what a douchebag. And an hour later, you're asking him to leave. Why the hell are you letting him in? And why are you waiting that hour? Wait just sets you up for failure. If you know they're going to be a problem, the first sign of trouble with any sort of guest, go deal with it. Don't wait for it to get worse. Managers, let your employees be proactive to the point where they feel empowered to help you. Once they feel pro empowered by being proactive and solving problems, you've really limited your liability by giving these people almost a sense of ownership. They found a drunk. They discovered him before they were problems. They told you, you got him out. That drunk goes home. Great. You know, and another point on being proactive is, is spend the time with your employees to coach him and, and find opportunities to help them identify problems before they happen. All right. So Robert, Proactive, uh, being proactive, habits, what do we do next? I'd move into documentation. It's another area that from the beginning of our topic to now has built. If you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. And think about that. We know it happened, but prove to me it happened. I think this is one area that operators probably don't do or don't do well. Well, and, and we've both seen it, but we're going to make this another podcast topic, just documentation, because there's so much to this. W what we want to give you today, though, is remember to limit that liability and reduce your potential losses from liability, you need to write things down. And what we're talking about is writing the first meeting you had down. Who was there? How long was the meeting? What were the talking points at that meeting? If you have end of shift meetings, write it down that you did it. If you have training meetings once a month, write it down. If you walk someone out and it was done correctly, write it down. Fights, trouble, problems. If you don't document issues, you're going to lose money because you can't prove you did it. And this is, this is an area of management that is probably, it doesn't get done because nobody likes to do it. It's a difficult process. I mean, most people who are in this business are very social, outgoing people, and we like to move, and we like to interact with people. So to 
sit us down at a desk and, and tell us to write something is something that's probably very difficult, but it is a necessary aspect of the job. It, it's one of the scarier points for me, Manny, when I go work with a small or a large venue and they had an incident, they flew me in to look at this incident. It was a stabbing. They fly me into their city to interview their employees and prepare for a lawsuit later. And they've got one word statements. I, I saw a fight. I grabbed a guy and walked him out. What is a fight? What did you see? Where did you take him out? What door? Where were you at? What did you hear? Did you see any witnesses? What did the guy say when you grabbed? I could go on. None of this is written down. And I know it seems tedious, but remember what I said this case was? It was a stabbing. This is someone that may die, may end up with, with major damage. And you wrote, I saw a fight and grabbed a guy and took him outside. That's your statement? Yeah, the, the documentation or the intensity of the documentation has to match the intensity of the incident, um, which we know this is a very important topic. And, and you and I both know that at some point we'll be doing a whole show on documentation. So implementing documentation, what do you do after that? This, this is the largest one to me, training, training, and more training. Remember we started with having a meeting with your employees? That's training because you're, you're changing their mindset and you're training them to do things different. Now as an individual point where we've talked about your assessment and hiring practices and cultures and habits and documentation, this is clearly, in my mind, the number one thing that an operator must do when he goes in or she goes in or wants to change their operation is implement training from the server's to the guards, there has to be a training program that is current, up to date, and ongoing. And in many states and in cities, it's mandated by law. I've got clients now in California where it's state law, they still haven't become compliant. I keep reminding them, your guards aren't licensed. We're going to get to it. Okay. You're illegally operating. So just, just so the listeners know that, uh, in the state of California, we have what's called the Proprietary Security Officers License, uh, which is basically a 16-hour program. Uh, and that license is required if you're going to work as a security guard. Absolutely. Background check, registration, and 16 hours of training. So we have a mechanism here in California um, that supports this training. Is there other states that do as well? Louisiana, the city of Philadelphia, New York state is changing theirs. It's coming where every state will have it, but the underlying theme is always training. And I think everyone understands that a better trained employee will be a better employee. And the, the owners and operators have to make time and, and provide the resources for this training. And there's a lot of it available. Our website, we do in person, we do online training, get the training for your staff and get the job and task appropriate training that's needed. All right, Robert. Well, um, why don't we take a break here and then we'll, we'll come back. We'll wrap up the show. We got a few announcements to make, uh, but yeah, we'll be right back. Thank you for joining us on our weekly podcast. Please like us on Facebook at nightclub security consultants. All right, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, so Robert, we wrapped up the show here and I just want to kind of highlight the points that we talked about today. Um, as far as what can you do today to limit your liability? Uh, the first thing that we talked about was an assessment, uh, doing a walkthrough, uh, taking a look at your business and, and what am I doing today that I can change. Uh, the next was uh, just setting the tone with your staff and making them aware of, of what you want to change. We talked about hiring practice, uh, practices, changing the culture, moving towards a more proactive culture, getting into the habits or routine of your shifts. We went into documentation. And, and training. And on the training aspect of it, I wanted just to to ask you, what are the things that some of the insurance companies are doing now in regards to training as far as offering discounts? Well, it's not that insurance companies, plural, are doing this. For years, we've tried to get them to be involved. There's a, a broker out of Florida. He's got an office in uh, Vegas also. His name is Pike Barber. Pike with the Hospitality Insurance Agency approached me about four years ago. He had a client that had some issues. He saw our syllabus and our curriculum, and he said, can you help our client? We'd like to you know, lower their claims. And we did. And immediately he came back after he attended and said, Bob, I want to do this on a regular basis. I want to get your program cleared through national insurance agencies such as EverGuard or Scottsdale. And these are two of the big players 
nationwide that write premise liability and assault and battery insurance. Well, they've approved our program, and Pike now writes. And if, if a bar owner were to go through our program with his staff, they can get a minimum of 10% off their assault and battery and premise liability. Think, think about that. If a policy for a year is 60 grand for a medium to large club for premise liability and assault and battery insurance, they take our 10-hour host training program. They take our five-hour advanced program, which is some hands-on role play. They use our policy manuals and our procedures. 10% off, that's paid for a three, four, five days training seminar for their employees. Yeah, if you if our listener would like more information about uh, Pike and, and his company, we'll go ahead and put the link up on our show notes. Um, and actually, we're going to be seeing Pike here in about three weeks. Twentieth and the twenty third, twentieth through the twenty third of August, we'll be at the the two thousand thirteen Gentlemen's Club Owners Expo in Vegas at Mandalay Bay. Yeah, and that show's put on by ED Publications. Uh, we'll actually put a a link on our show notes to the show if you're interested. And Robert, you're going to be taking part in a workshop at that show. We do. We show it several shows around the year, but this one is probably the best regarding education for any of the listeners. You know, Mandalay Bay is a great host venue. It's wonderful. But the way ED Publications does it, the Gentleman's Club show is set up as a learning event. The first day, Tuesday, is educational seminars nearly all day. Then Wednesday and Thursday are half-day educational seminars. And the trade show of, of this industry opens up at 1 p.m. on both Wednesday and Thursday. We'll be giving a seminar on Tuesday at 5 p.m., 5 to 6 p.m. And that seminar will be with Jim St. John, uh, former president of Deja Vu Consulting, along with a, uh, a liquor consultant named Bob Johnson. And our program will be on in inventory, cost-cutting ways, ways to slash expenses within the club industry. And I'll, I'll give points regarding the security side of the house. And Bob will give points regarding the alcohol service side of the house with Jim moderating that panel on uh, Tuesday between five and six. Uh, and Jim St. John, who will be on that panel, uh, he's also the president of ACE. Yeah. Right? The association of club executives. That's the, the national association for gentlemen's club owners. Yeah. Again, for the listeners, if you're interested in the show, uh, we'll be putting up a, a link for registration. I think, I believe there's still room available. It's a, it's a three day conference. Uh, currently they have, I believe over 3000 attendees scheduled, uh, to show up. Uh, it's going to be about 300 booths yep. showing different companies. So it's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of information. If you're into the industry, uh, and you want to, you want to go out there, please check out our, our show notes for the link. Also, we have a couple other dates, Robert coming up that we do a lot of in-person training. Uh, we're going to be in L.A. for our in-person California PSO license. That's a proprietary security office, officer's license. Uh, that training is going to be at the Crocker Club in downtown L.A., uh, July 22nd to the 24th. What a beautiful venue, the Crocker Club on oh, it's South gorgeous. Spring Street. Uh, Robert, you're also going to be out in Washington, D.C. doing the uh, National Host Program training uh, July 29th and 30th. Uh, you're doing that in conjunction with... Well, that'll be a Monday and a Tuesday, as you said, the 29th and 30th at Shadow Room. Uh, Steve at Shadow Room has been a great host at uh, 2131 uh, K Street Northwest in D.C. And obviously, if you haven't been to Shadow Room, you got to visit that place because it's unbelievable too. Uh, and you're going to be doing that in conjunction with Ram W? The Restaurant Association of Metro D.C. And one of our other sponsors is D.C. Nightlife Association there. Uh, yeah, so if you're interested, if you're in those cities and you're interested in those trainings, uh, visit our website. There will be more information posted. Uh, let's see what else we got, Robert. I think that's about it for today's show. If you like today's show, uh, we'd like to encourage all of our listeners to find us on Facebook. You can find us at facebook.com forward slash bouncer training. Please like us. Our podcast is on nightclubsecurity.com forward slash podcast. You can also find us on iTunes. We're in the business section. Uh, search for nightclub security podcast. Uh, again, we would love, we would love to hear some questions, comments from our listeners. Our intent is to, uh, one part of the show, each show is to, to answer questions from our listeners. Uh, you can email those at questions at nightclubsecurity.com. Uh, if you're a bouncer, uh, an owner operating, need more resources. We are the nightclub security consultants. You can always find more information at nightclubsecurity.com. 
We do offer a range of services, including consulting, training, both in person and online, uh, investigations, and expert witness. Uh, we'd love to help you out. Uh, that's all for us until next week. I'm Manny Marquez. I'm Robert Smith. Be nice.